Hi everyone and welcome to History Calling. Today's video is the fourth in my series on the Six Wives of Henry VIII and it's going to look at the life of Anne of Cleves. At first glance, Anne's story might seem to be one of disappointed hopes and failure, but I'm going to show why she was actually the luckiest of all Henry's wives. If you stay till the end, I'll also let you know what next week's video on her successor, Catherine Howard, will be about. Anne was born in Cleves in modern-day Germany on the 22nd of September 1515, the second of four children of Duke John III of Cleves and his wife Maria of Ulichburg. She wasn't from a great royal house, though she was a descendant of Edward I of England, and Cleves has instead been summed up by Antonia Fraser as part of, quote, the intricate world of the Lower Rhine, a maze of duchies, electorates and bishoprics, at first sight far removed from the great political game being played out elsewhere between mightier powers. Her childhood was quiet and sheltered, and she was reportedly never far from her mother's elbow. There had been plans in 1527 to marry her to the then 10-year-old Francis, son of the Duke of Lorraine, but this had fallen through by February 1535, though as we'll see that wasn't the end of the story. For now though, in the late 1530s, she was still on the marriage market. Enter Henry VIII. Henry was on the hunt for a new wife after the death of Jane Seymour in October 1537, and as negotiations to secure the hand of the 16-year-old widow Christina of Denmark, Duchess of Milan, fell through, Anne, somewhat unexpectedly, moved to the top of the list of potential wives. The king was looking for an alliance which would help him to offset the new, warmer relations between France and Spain, a situation which was being encouraged by Pope Paul III, who wasn't a fan of the King of England given Henry's recent break with Rome and establishment of the Church of England. In fact, in December 1538, the Pope enacted a bull of excommunication against Henry which had lain dormant since its creation in 1535. The king needed to make some new friends, and he was willing to look outside the powerhouses of Spain and France to find her. This is how Anne suddenly found herself in the running to become the next Queen of England. It was a role for which she was woefully unprepared. She spoke and wrote no language other than her native German, couldn't play any musical instruments or sing, and her main pastime seems to have been needlework. Nevertheless, Henry's great court painter Hans Holbein was dispatched in August 1539 to paint her portrait, and we can see the results of his efforts here. It was on the basis of this image, which was described by an English envoy as being accurate, and on reports of Anne's modesty and chastity, that Henry agreed to make her his wife. The marriage treaty was signed on the 4th of October, and Anne arrived in England on the 27th of December, making her way to the Bishop of Rochester's palace by the 31st. Unfortunately, things got off to a very bad start. Henry arrived in disguise to visit her on New Year's Day, but was disappointed with her looks and disgruntled when she didn't realise who he was, even when he suddenly embraced her. This confusion led her to treat him in a polite but ultimately uninterested manner and return her attention to the bullfight she had been watching out her window. It was only when he returned to her a few minutes later in his royal garb that she realised her mistake. The whole thing had been a fiasco. Lord Russell, who witnessed the meeting, reported that, quote, he never saw his highness so marvellously astonished and abashed as on that occasion. Henry himself commented afterwards that, I like her not, and that if he had known what he was to marry, Anne would never have come within my kingdom, for she was nothing so fair as she had been reported. Despite what you may have heard, though, one thing he didn't call her was a Flanders mare. That was a story made up in the late 17th century. For all the king's doubts, though, it was too late to back out of the wedding. Henry didn't want to risk pushing Anne's brother William, who was now the Duke of Cleves after the death of their father in 1539, into the arms of the French and Spanish, and so the marriage went ahead on the 6th of January at Greenwich Palace. Henry complained later that, I never for love to the woman consented to marry, and the morning after the wedding said that, he liked her before not well, but now I like her much worse. He disparaged Anne's figure, saying that her breasts were, quote, so slack and other parts of body in such sort that he somewhat suspected her virginity, clearly a preposterous idea given her strict upbringing. Henry, though, felt that he, quote, could never in her company be provoked and steered to know her carnally, and it seems that he never did. 
When Anne's ladies asked the Queen what went on between she and Henry when they slept together, Anne replied that when Henry came to bed, quote, he kisses me and taketh me by the hand and biddeth me good night, sweetheart, and in the morning kisses me and biddeth me farewell, darling. Is that not enough? she asked her maids. Madam, said Lady Rutland, there must be more. There never was. As he was prone to do, Henry soon became enamoured of one of his wife's ladies in waiting, a teenager by the name of Catherine Howard. By May, the Cleves marriage was dead in the water. All that remained were the formalities of having it annulled. Using the excuse of the pre-contract with Francis of Lorraine, which by the laws of the time might actually have constituted a valid impediment to the marriage with Henry, along with the issue of non-consummation, Anne's marriage was declared void by Parliament in mid-July. Henry's chief minister, Thomas Cromwell, who the king saw as the architect of the whole thing, was beheaded for his trouble on the 28th, the same day that Henry married Catherine Howard. Now I know what you're thinking. Where does the luck come in? So far, Anne had been raised by an overbearing mother in the 16th century equivalent of a royal backwater, barely educated compared to most European princesses of her time, sent across the continent to a country where she didn't speak the language to marry an irascible bully of a man, twice her age, who had abandoned two wives already and cut off one of their heads, only to be dumped after six months for her younger, better-looking lady-in-waiting, and with the excuse that her husband found her so physically repulsive that he couldn't bring himself to fully sleep with her. It looks bad, I know, but Anne was to rise like a phoenix from the ashes, and it's what happened next that made her so lucky. The key to her success was that she didn't fight Henry. Though she was shocked and distressed at the situation she now found herself in, she quickly gave him exactly what he wanted, and agreed to the annulment of their marriage with the following letter. Pleaseth your most excellent majesty to understand that, whereas at sundry times heretofore I have been informed and perceived by certain lords and others of your grace's council, of the doubts and questions which have been moved and found in our marriage, and how hath petition thereupon been made to your highness by our nobles and commons, that the same might be examined and determined by the holy clergy of this realm, to testify to your highness by my writing that which I have before promised by word and will, that is to say, that the matter should be examined and determined by the said clergy. It may please your majesty to know that, though this case must needs be most hard and sorrowful unto me, for the great love which I bear to your most noble person, yet having more regard to God and his truth than to any worldly affection, as it beseemed me at the beginning to submit me to such examination and determination of the said clergy, whom I have and do accept for judges competent in that behalf. So now, being ascertained how the same clergy hath therein given their judgment and sentence, I acknowledge myself hereby to accept and approve the same, wholly and entirely putting myself for my state and condition to your highness's goodness and pleasure. Most humbly beseeching your majesty that, though it be determined that the pretended matrimony between us is void and of none effect, whereby I neither can nor will repute myself for your grace's wife, considering this sentence, whereunto I stand, and your majesty's clean and pure living with me, yet it will please you to take me for one of your most humble servants, and so to determine of me as I may sometimes have the fruition of your most noble presence, which as I shall esteem for a great benefit, so my lords and others of your majesty's counsel now being with me, have put me in comfort thereof, and that your highness will take me for your sister, for the which I most humbly thank you accordingly. Thus, most gracious Prince, I beseech our Lord God to send your majesty long life and good health, to God's glory, your own honour, and the wealth of this noble realm. From Richmond, the 11th day of July, the 32nd year of your majesty's most noble reign, your majesty's most humble sister and servant, Anne, the daughter of Cleves. This signature at the bottom of the letter also showed her submission. Rather than Anne the Queen, she was once again the daughter of Cleves. She also returned her wedding ring to Henry, requesting that it be broken into pieces, for it now had, quote, no force or value. This was vastly different to the painful process Henry had gone through to extricate himself from his first two marriages, and his response was equally changed. Rather than banishing and demeaning Anne as he had done to Catherine of Aragon, or taking her head as he had done to Anne Boleyn, Henry was all generosity. As Anne had indicated in her letter, she was transformed from his queen to his sister. Rather conveniently, his actual sisters, Mary and Margaret, were dead in the case of Mary or living in Scotland in the case of Margaret by this point, and so raised no complaints. She was to outrank every lady in the kingdom save the king's wife and daughters, and she was provided with homes and estates in multiple counties around the country, including the Boleyn family home, Hever Castle, 
all of which totaled the astronomical amount of between three and four thousand pounds a year. The only condition, aside from agreeing to the annulment itself, of course, was that she remain in England, unable to go abroad and potentially complain of Henry's treatment of her. Anne, who apparently feared that if she returned home someone would, quote, slay her for the disgrace this annulment had brought on her and her family, agreed. Thus, by the time of her 25th birthday in September, Anne could reflect that, though she was no longer a queen, she had gained wealth, security, position and independence, all without having to stay married to the aged and mercurial Henry VIII or returning to live under the thumb of her mother in Cleves. Nor would she be forced back onto the marriage market to take her chances with another unknown husband, thereby avoiding the risk of dying in childbed, something which had, after all, killed Henry's mother and his third and sixth wives. She was popular with the English people too, who loved and esteemed her as the sweetest, most gracious and kindest queen they ever had or would desire, according to one ambassador. Though things hadn't panned out as she might have hoped, she was her own woman and living a life which was a far cry from her relatively humble origins. Her life was also far from over. She was still received at court with honour during the short tenure of Catherine Howard as Queen, dining with Henry and Catherine and even dancing with her successor at the New Year's celebrations in January 1541. She also got along well with Princesses Mary and Elizabeth. It was reported that she revelled in her new sense of freedom too. The Imperial Ambassador Eustace Chapuis reported that she enjoyed a drink while the French ambassador, Charles de Marillac, commented that she used her money to indulge in, quote, all the recreation she could in diversity of dress and pastime. The overriding impression she gave to those who saw her was that she was happy with her lot. Things weren't perfect, of course. When Catherine Howard's fall came in 1542, Anne and her supporters hoped that Henry might take her back, but these hopes were quickly dashed, and scurrilous stories appeared that she might have had illegitimate children, probably because she put on some weight. She was insulted too that the king's sixth wife, Catherine Parr, was, to Anne's mind at least, not nearly as beautiful as she, and she sometimes talked wistfully of returning to Cleves. Several years went by in this way. Then, in January 1547, the king died. Anne lived on, though, right through Edward VI's reign and into the reign of her one-time stepdaughter, Mary I, whose coronation she attended in a coach with Princess Elizabeth. Indeed, by now, Anne had risen to become the third lady in the kingdom after these two sisters. Evidently, she did not feel this was reflected in her financial position, though, for she had, or felt she had, money concerns during Edward and Mary's reigns, and made failed petitions to the Queen to improve her position and potentially even allow her to return home. These requests were refused. Poverty is a relative term, though. Anne wrote letters which she signed, From my poor house at Hever, but Hever, remember, is a castle, and it's anything but poor then and now. It was also only one of a number of houses she owned, including Richmond Palace. Rather than being badly treated by her former stepchildren, it seems more likely that Anne was either imagining problems, being swindled by her servants, or spending beyond her means, which would have been quite a feat given the riches Henry had bestowed upon her. It is her longevity combined with her wealth and comfortable lifestyle, both of which she had, whether she fully admitted to it or not, which to my mind makes Anne the luckiest of all Henry's queens. She avoided the grisly fate of Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard and the tragedy of Jane Seymour, who died while still in her twenties from purple fever. As for Henry's sixth wife, Catherine Parr, who is most often remembered as the one who survived, I would argue that it is really Anne who deserves this title, for Catherine died 19 months after Henry at the age of 36. Anne of Cleves, for her part, was 41 by the time of her own death, which occurred on the 16th of July, 1557, at Chelsea Manor in London. She was buried the following month in a grand funeral at Westminster Abbey. Of course, 41 isn't old by any stretch of the imagination, but it was a respectable age for the time period, and the only one of Henry's wives to live longer was Catherine of Aragon, who passed away a few weeks after her 50th birthday. Much of her life had been overshadowed by misery, however, starting with the death of her first husband, Prince Arthur, which led to years of financial difficulties, followed by the loss of most of her children and her eventual abandonment and denigration by Henry and forced separation from their daughter. Even in death, she was insulted by being buried with the rank of Princess Dowager of Wales rather than a queen. I think it would be a stretch to say she was luckier than Anne of Cleves simply because she lived eight years longer. Do you agree, though? Luck does, after all, mean different things to different people, and I certainly wouldn't claim that Anne had the luckiest of lives in general, only when compared to Henry's other queens. Let me know in the comments section below what you think, and which of Henry's wives you would trade places with if you absolutely had to. 
Check out the description box as well for some suggestions for books, films, documentaries and television shows which depict Anne's story. I'll be back next week for a video on Catherine Howard in which I'll discuss what she really looked like and if a portrait supposedly of her is in fact Henry's doomed fifth queen. Till then, keep learning.